two squares of chocolate, two tablespoons butter, melt on low heat, stir in one cup of milk, bring to a boil, three cups of sugar, one teaspoon of vanilla, a pinch of salt, cook to soft ball stage, pour on marble slab, cook and beat and eat. This is a recipe for fudge. Kay's fudge, to be exact. Kay was Kay Andrews. And what interests me is not so much the recipe as where it's found. It's inscribed on Kay's tombstone at the Logan City Cemetery in Utah. Now, I've heard of poems and I've heard of pictures, but a recipe on a gravestone? The monument has drawn so many visitors that the section of the cemetery has come to be known as the fudge section. This is just one of the many interesting and unusual inscriptions on monuments chronicled in a book about cemetery symbols and iconography by photographer and author Douglas Keister. For his part, Mr. Keister plans a bench with the inscription, Keister's go here. Lest you think that such unusual descriptions are not something that Jews do, you need only look to the tomb of Ida Kleinman in Rehovot in Israel and check out her recipe for Nustort. Now, I know it's a bit dangerous to talk about food on Yom Kippur, but I share it with you today not for the sake of the recipe, but to consider what we write on headstones and why. The topic is personal. After my father's death last November, I've been giving this some thought as my mom, sisters, and I worked on the wording and design of a monument for him. It's not an easy decision or an easy process. After all, how do you capture a life in a few words or phrases? You don't. Beyond my personal interest, though, Yom Kippur challenges us to consider life's essential questions. Is the life that I'm living now how I want to be remembered? Who do I want to be in the time I have left? For one well-known scientist turned philanthropist, it was not. Perhaps you know this story. When Emile Nobel was killed in a factory explosion, a newspaper mistakenly ran a long obituary about his brother, Alfred, who was still very much alive. So Alfred had an opportunity granted few people to read his own obituary while he was alive. And what he read horrified him. The newspaper described a man who had made it possible for more people to be killed more quickly than anyone else who had ever lived. You see, Alfred had invented dynamite. At that moment, Alfred realized two things. One, this was how he was going to be remembered, and two, this was not how he wanted to be remembered. Shortly thereafter, he established the Nobel Prize. Today, everyone knows the Nobel Prize, but few know how he made his fortune. Picturing our obituaries, or more narrowly, what will be written on our gravestones, motivates us to think about how we spend our lives. I know it sounds a bit morbid, but the idea is actually life affirming. Often we try to suppress the thought of death, thinking that the farther we get away from it, there we'll find happiness. But the opposite is actually true. By intentionally considering death, we can appreciate the present and focus on the future. This is not a uniquely Jewish idea. Think of Mexico's Day of the Dead or picture a medieval still life, a painting adorned with a skull and an hourglass. These memento mori, as they are known, are reminders that life is fleeting. For Jews, we know that this is an underlying message of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur has its own memento mori. We wear white kittles, which are likened to burial shrouds. We don't eat or engage in physical pleasures. We read a martyrology about sages willing to die for their values. We visit cemeteries at this, at this time of year and recite Yisker prayers. 
I heard of a colleague who prepares for Yom Kippur by writing two versions of his obituary. The first, how it would be written, and the second, how he would want it to be written. Today's opportunity for self-reflection invites us to make a course correction and to narrow the gap between who we are and who we want to be. So let me pause here for a moment of silence and ask you to consider what would you want written on your monument? Anyone choose a recipe? <laughs> After reading about the fudge tombstone, my family joked that for my dad, we should put a brisket recipe. <laughs> to be clear, I'm not anti-recipes if they capture really who the person was and how they should be remembered. But be sure to get the ingredients right. You see, the original fudge headstone had the wrong amount of vanilla, making the fudge runny. So they actually had to redo the monument. <laughs> The first reference to a tombstone in the Torah is the one that Jacob erected for his wife, Rachel. It was a stone pillar called a matseva, which comes from the root, which means standing. And indeed, it has stood the test of time. Rachel's tomb is south of Jerusalem, where it has been a pilgrimage site for millennia. In Talmudic times, tombstones, tombstones were known by a different name. They were called nifashot, which means souls because they were thought to actually house a person's soul. Today, of course, we don't think that a soul resides, resides in a stone monument, but I would say that people take great care what to include on a monument, not only because it is literally written in stone, but because they're trying to capture something of the person's spirit. Inquiries about monuments are thus amongst the most frequent questions I receive. I'm asked to proofread designs to make sure that the dates and spellings are correct. And at unveilings, I help decipher the symbols of the headstones. In truth, there are few requirements in Jewish law concerning matzevot, neither the design nor the wording, whether they're upright or flat, double or single. The general principle is that they should be of good taste, quiet dignity, and avoid ostentation. The question I'm raising today, though, is not about the size or the shape or the kind of stone. Rather, I'm asking about the words and symbols we agonize over to do the impossible, to describe a person and what they meant to their loved ones, to portray a person's personality, to capture core teachings of their life lesson. So what do people include? There have been periods in Jewish history where people included symbols of a person's profession, shears for a tailor, scales for a merchant, plows for a farmer. Other symbols speak about a person's attributes, books for a person of wisdom, a candelabra because they shed light of joy. And today you can see carvings that represent people's interests and passions, animals, cars, music, and dance. And then there are the words or short phrases that themselves speak volumes, loving husband or wife, Bubby or Zadie, child or friend. Or you might see these, which are quotes on real monuments. I was hoping for a pyramid or this one. He loved math. Oh, and his wife and his kids too. Or raised four beautiful daughters with only one bathroom and still there was love or died from not forwarding this text message to 10 people. People write and they put all kinds of things on monuments. And then there are the things that you never see. Rich man, well-dressed, had power. It's not that any of these things are bad, 
if we use them to do good. But it does kind of make you wonder if these things aren't important enough to inscribe on an epitaph at the end, how do we spend so much of our strength and time on them during life? It's a lesson that one man learned the hard way. Chaim was a rich man who was near death. He was very grieved because he had worked very hard for his money and he wanted to take it with him to heaven. So Chaim began to pray fervently. Chaim, hearing his prayer, an angel said to him, sorry, but if you can't take it with you, Chaim implored the angel saying, speak to God and see if there's some exception. A few minutes later, the angel reappeared and informed Chaim that God would allow him to take one carry-on with him. Overjoyed, Chaim gathered the largest suitcase he had and he filled it with pure bars of gold. Chaim died and he made his way to the gates of heaven where he was met by the angel Gabriel. I have to check the contents of the bag before letting it through, said Gabriel. So Gabriel opened the suitcase to inspect the worldly possessions that Chaim found too precious to leave behind and exclaimed, you brought pavement? <laughs> it's not what we take with us. It's what we leave behind that matters. Our good name, our good deeds, our virtues and values passed on to family, friends, the community who will continue our legacy. In the words of the first century sage Rabban Gamliel, we need not erect monuments for the righteous, for their words are their memorial. Tanai Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel, ein osim nifashot litzadikim, divrehem hein zichronehem. And yet, with all due respect to Rabban Gamliel, what we write matters and is a lasting memorial. On Yom Kippur, we pray to be inscribed in Sefer Chaim, the Book of Life. I've always understood this to mean that on the high holidays, we pray that God grants us life and health and peace and prosperity, all good things in the years to come. Today, I think about the phrase slightly differently. It's not just what God writes, it's what we write that will eventually be inscribed in stone. Yom Kippur reminds us that we are the authors of our book of life. We may not be able to rewrite previous chapters, but we can write them, R-I-G-H-T. We can write them through tshuva, through repentance, and we can shape the ending by the choices we make. If you knew that you had only a certain number of days or months to live, you would make very different decisions and if you knew that you had decades, wrote Maya Bernstein last year in an essay titled Yom Kippur, a lesson about living with mortality. In previous years, Bernstein considered this theme of Yom Kippur as a time to confront mortality and embrace life. She considered it to be a bit trite, but then she got cancer. And she realized she had a choice how she wanted to live with the time that she had. She became less rushed developed clarity and confidence about how she wanted to spend her time and with whom. And she found that this encounter with death shifted her into what she called short-term living that was powerful and freeing. I reprioritized my work, she said. I took long walks. I ate ice cream. I reconnected with a handful of friends. I restarted writing poetry and played the piano in the evenings and when my doctors finally allowed it, I swam in pools and it, ponds, and it was heaven. After each swim, I was moved to tears with gratitude for the gift of the clouds above the water. That's how precious each day, sometimes each hour, was. Admittedly, short-term living isn't easy. It's hard to live with that expanded consciousness all the time. We're busy. We have things to do and they matter. And sometimes we have to do things that we don't like doing. But then along it comes once a year. And Yom Kippur says, this is the only life you're given. Live it wisely. Live it intentionally. 
Live it so that you're proud of the book of life that you write. Live it so that your life is a monument to the values you espouse. Live it so that what is etched in stone is what you want etched in the hearts of those who love you. So what is it that my family chose to put on my father's matzeva? I have to give credit to my older sister for this suggestion. It's a phrase that comes from a second century sage that captures how he lived and the lessons he left his family. It's a message that in his memory and honor, I leave with you as we enter this new year, 57. 83. According to the effort, so is the reward. Shana Tova.